Hebrews chapter 11. Let me read to you verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. <coughs> we began a new series of teaching three weeks ago, calling it Living by Faith. Living by Faith. We want to use Hebrews 11 as a launching pad, so to speak, for our teaching because it's a great chapter on faith. In the first few verses it describes faith and then it goes on to give so many examples of faith. Faith for so many kinds of things in life. And so it's a rich resource for learning about faith and so we're going to use Hebrews chapter 11 as a launching pad to learn about faith. The first three weeks we talked about hope because in this definition in first verse it says that faith is the confidence of the things hoped for, one translation says. Faith is a substance of things hoped for is what King James says. But a better translation, faith is the confidence of the things hoped for. So I began to describe to you what hope is. Because hope is very basic to faith. Hope is where everything starts. A person in trouble, in problem, begins to see the word of God. And I showed you how from the word of God is where we get hope. Romans 15.4 tells us that the word of God, particularly Paul is referring to the scriptures of the Old Testament during his days. He says, there was no New Testament. He says, these scriptures are written for our benefit so that we may become people of hope. We may have hope. So the scriptures were meant to give us hope. And uh, <clears throat> so hope comes from the word of God and that's where that becomes the foundation for faith. And I showed you that hope is a vision or expectation of good things to come. Expectation is a good word, expectation of good things to come. <coughs> now, in the next week I followed it up by saying that it's not a mere expectation, it's a confident expectation. Now, the word hope as used in the world uh, is not the way the Bible uses the word hope. In the world when we say I hope, you know, we really mean I doubt whether I'm really going to make it, I'm, I hope I make it, I hope I get a job, I hope uh, I get this and so on. Built into that hope is a doubt about whether I will get it or not. So the world uses it in that way and also the world uses it in a way where it seems like it speaks of just a wish or a wishful desire. Uh, that's how hope is represented in the world. But the Bible hope is not like that. Bible hope is about certainty. So we talked about certainty the second week. What kind of certainty? Not a mathematical certainty, not a logical certainty, but a moral certainty. When we say a moral certainty, we talked about how that moral certainty is based on who God is because He is the giver of the promise. Is He good? Is He faithful? He cannot lie? He's holy, he's righteous, he's just, he's all powerful. Based on that, we know that what he, is, what he has promised, he is able to do, and therefore we can have a confident expectation of what he says. So, hope, as spoken of in the Bible, is a confident expectation of good things to come in our life. And the third week we talked about how this confident expectation is the anchor of our soul. The anchor of our soul. What does anchor do to a ship? It keeps it from being beaten by the wind and the wave, thrown about and uh, crushed. You know, it makes it stand in one place solid even in spite of all the wind and the wave and everything every other circumstance outside. 
in the same way god has given us an anchor for our soul and that anchor for our soul is this certainty of this hope this confident expectation so that no matter what the outward situations are we can stand solid we are not shaken we are not wavering we can have this hope that helps us to stay solid so these three weeks we talked about it now next thing i want to do is i want to go to the next line in this definition which is the evidence of things not seen i want to spend two three weeks on how f- what faith has to do with the unseen how faith has to do with the unseen but before that i want to spend this one week on one particular matter and that is the importance of faith because we are getting really into faith now and more and more into faith i want to share something about the importance of faith now the reason is this <clears throat> now today people do not emphasize faith the modern church does not emphasize faith they emphasize certain things as the will of god and so on but when it comes to problems in life the problems that an average man faces in life the needs the difficulties the challenges the problems in life they do not apply the principles of faith to it if you notice the church basically applies faith and its principles only to the matter of salvation they are stuck with justification by faith that is how a how a unrighteous man sinner becomes a child of god and faith is applied only to the matter of salvation basically they do not apply the principles of faith to every situation in life to overcome that situation but the bible talks about faith for living the just shall live by faith the bible says it comes from habakkuk habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 if you notice the situation is very bad everything is not working out nothing is the field is not yielding even the cows are not uh, producing even uh, the trees are not producing any fruit in such a situation the prophet says the just shall live by his faith the just shall live by his faith there in the original in the hebrew in the in the in the book of habakkuk where the original uh, verse comes from i say original because three other times it is mentioned in the bible the same verse the just shall live by faith comes three other times in the new testament in romans in galatians and in hebrews so in the book of habakkuk in the original situation it was about all kinds of problems going on around them and there in the midst of it the prophet is saying the just shall live by faith therefore i say to you he is applying faith to life and life situations life's problems and i think that is the way it should be applied today and hebrews 11 is evidence to that that it should be applied to life's problems to every problem that we face every challenge we face it should be applied to the matter of salvation but then it should be applied to healing it should be applied uh, to uh, deliverance it should be applied uh, to our overcoming power over various situations in life uh, or various problems in life uh, that is the way the bible presents it i don't know somehow the modern church does not apply the principles of faith to these various problems but that is the thing that is most important because that is how you overcome these problems faith is an o- faith gives us overcoming power and so i want to emphasize the fact uh, the bible emphasizes faith and i want to show you that is according to your faith that's what i want to talk about it's according to your faith things happen in your life your faith is very important that's the subject i want to deal with today so please turn with me to matthew's gospel i want to go to basically two passages today matthew's gospel chapter 9 and let me read to you from verse 27 onwards when jesus departed from departed from there two blind men followed him crying out and saying son of david have mercy on us and when he had come into the house the blind men came to him and jesus said to them do you believe that i'm able to do this they said to him yes lord then he touched their eyes saying according to your faith let it be to you and their eyes were open and jesus sternly warned them saying see that no one knows it 
Now, I want to say this about the Bible first of all. The things recorded in the Bible, you need to first of all have in mind under what situation the Bible was written. In the days when the Bible was written, it was much different. Paper was not available as freely as it is available today. Today, I buy papers, you know, in stacks and keep them and I write a few lines and if I don't like what I've written, I just throw it away and take another piece of paper and write because it's cheap and, and plenty of it is available and, and it's not a real problem, you know, <laughs> these days. Uh, we don't even think about wasting paper, you know, it's just, we just use paper a lot. It doesn't mean anything to us, it's not a big thing. But back in those days, paper was not available in this form. Written material was expensive, therefore everything was not, it, it was not used extensively. Uh, so the days were different. So when they wrote these Gospels, when they wrote the epistles and so on, to economize when you write was very important at that time. Not write a whole bunch of stuff, but write what is necessary and what is important. Avoid all unnecessary stuff because you can't be just writing unlimitedly, you know. So that was the thing that was happening. In that situation where they were trying to economize and write as little as possible, I say to you, they chose these passages, these things that they have written and recorded here, because they had great value. These things were preached again and again by apostles like Peter and others uh, to teach from what Jesus taught. Remember Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospels, make uh, preach the gospel, make disciples and then uh, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. Some people read only up to that. This is Matthew 28 verse 18. But verse 19 says, after you make disciples, preach, after you preach the gospel, make disciples and baptize them. And then it says, teaching them to observe the things that I have taught you. That's very important. What goes on after you baptize? That's what the church is all about. What did they teach in the first century church? They taught what Jesus taught them. He said, teach what I have taught you. So I can imagine what was happening in the first century church. People like Peter and the other apostles would take from what Jesus taught, from the miracles that Jesus did and so on, and mention what happened, narrate the story as it happened, and bring out the truth, particularly the incidences where, uh, which were used to teach them certain lessons. You know, many miracles Jesus did in order to teach them faith. And uh, used many miracles to teach them faith. And uh, for, the, for example, the miracle of uh, cursing the fig tree. He didn't have to curse the fig tree. The fig tree didn't do anything wrong. It was just sitting there waiting for the season for figs to come so that it can give its fruit. But yet Jesus cursed the fig tree. But the story goes that next day they were coming the same way. The tree withered away. Leaves have fallen and the tree had withered away. And Jesus immediately takes off into a teaching about faith. He said, have faith in God or have the faith of God. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart that what he has said will come to pass. He shall have whatever he says. Therefore, when you pray, believe that you receive, well, believe that you receive whatever you desire and ask and you shall have them. Now see, he goes on in a teaching about faith. <laughs> so the whole thing happened in order to teach them faith. Jesus cursed the fig tree. 24 hours later, the leaves withered away. And they were stunned and astonished at the fact that what Jesus said actually happened. Jesus says, if you say even to the mountain, this will happen. Not only to the tree, even to the mountain you can speak. And what you say will come to pass. That's the power of faith. And you can use this power of faith in your prayer and so on. He goes on teaching about that. So many situations, many things that were happening around the disciples and Jesus were used as illustrations to teach them. Even during miracles, it was used as illustrations to teach them. So you can, you can imagine, you know, how, uh, you know, these things were selected then. The most valuable illustrations that the illustrations that taught 
very clearly what Jesus taught. The most important truths. They were selected, handpicked and the Holy Spirit of God helped them to pick it and put it in here so that it can become the teaching of the church for centuries to come. That is how the Gospels came about. That is how even the epistles came about. That is why it is very, and uh, it must be noted that Hebrews chapter 11 with 40 verses, actually the chapter is 40 verses, but the subject begins way before the 11th chapter, few verses before the 11th chapter, and ends few verses after the, uh, after the 12th chapter begins. So it's about 40, 50 verses are written such a lengthy passage written on faith because it was a very important subject in the first century. What, is, what we read in Hebrews 11 was a preaching that was done by preachers in those days. The author of the book of Hebrews must have taught it to the New Testament church. Now we have it in writing. But to put it in writing, they thought a lot. Only if it's important and carried a lot of value, they put it in writing. So you must think about it like that. So here... This is one of those Holy Ghost picked stories. Stories that they felt is essential to teach a lesson. That is why it is not, it is not just saying that Jesus healed a man. It talks about what that man said, what these two men said to Jesus and what Jesus replied and how he healed. The entire conversation that happened between the blind men and Jesus is spoken of here so that we can learn things from it. I'm sure that this is what they used to teach in the first church uh, when they decided to teach about uh, faith. So listen to this. Listen to what is being emphasized here. Two blind men are following Jesus and they follow him right into a house that he walked into. And they come into the house all the way they were coming, following him and they were saying, have mercy on a son of David. And then when they came into the house, the blind man came to him and said to him, uh, but the blind man came to him and Jesus could tell that these guys have come and they're asking, when they're asking for mercy, they're basically asking for healing. Now healing is a mercy, <laughs> right? That is why when people say healing is not for today, I say, is mercy not for today? <laughs> Has God stopped being merciful? So healing is a mercy. So these fellows come and ask for mercy and Jesus understands they're asking for healing. So Jesus says to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, yes, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were open and Jesus sternly warned them saying, see that no one knows it. Now, why all these details are mentioned here? So that we may learn from it. Something very important about faith. They, they come in and Jesus says to them, when they said they wanted healing, Jesus says, do you believe that I am able to do this for you? Do you believe that I'm able to do this? In other words, do you have faith? Do you have faith that I'm able to do this for you? Now this is very important because today's church emphasizes the will of God and would say, is this the will of God to heal this man? Here, Jesus doesn't even seem to bother about the will of God. Why? Not because he doesn't care about the will of God. He is very certain about the will of God. He is very sure that God wants to heal. <laughs> that one thing he is very sure. He, that one thing he knows he doesn't have to ask God. God wants to heal. Healing is the will of God. So he doesn't go into the fact of whether it's the will of God or not. Like the today's church. You know, have you ever seen that when it comes to salvation, when somebody comes and says, I'm convicted in my heart that I'm a sinner, I want to accept Jesus as Savior. Would you say, have you seen anybody say to that person, hope it's the will of God to heal, I mean, to save you. We'll pray for you that the will of God may be done. Nobody will say that. They'll say, all right, come. Do what? Confess Jesus as your Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. They'll say, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Be saved right now, right? Nobody will say, let's check if it's the will of God or let's pray that the will of God be done in this matter. They don't talk about the will of God. Why? Because in salvation, they know the Bible says that it is the will of God for all men to come into the knowledge of God, that none perish. They know it. 
so they don't talk about the will of god but when somebody comes for healing or some other need they say may the will of god be done brother <coughs> and they pray for the person also many times saying may the will of the lord be done they just don't know what the will of the lord is so they just they are not sure so the, let the father if it be your will do this you know they are not sure about it that is what i'm talking about they are afraid to apply faith to other matters of life they are only able to apply faith to salvation but not to other matters of life but the bible applies faith to all kinds of matters you look at the examples i will show you when i come to hebrews chapter 11 the various heroes of faith and their uh, life and so on various points in their life they apply it to various situation we see abel applying to it applying it to the matter of his relationship with god you can say salvation enoch applies it in his walk with god abraham applies it you know in order to bear a child his wife bore a child by faith received strength to bear a child the bible says so in various ways they exercise their faith to receive various things from god so this is very important notice I, you know the church has missed it and the church has been crippled because of this because we are not able to tell the world what is your problem faith will set you free from that problem faith is the thing that you need by faith you can overcome so learn faith understand faith learn how to live by faith walk by faith and we are we fail to we, we just dismiss it saying let's see if it's the will of god we, we just don't know god has not changed like i said healing is a mercy and god has not stopped being merciful he was merciful in the old testament times he must be even more merciful today i think it's a better covenant with better promises he is still the healer he is always the same god is always the same he's always been a healer even you know the the old test in the old testament the uh, jewish people in the covenant with god healing was built in it healing was one of the things that god said he will do for them and he has healed them so many times you know and this was known to them that is why many times when when jesus deals with the jewish people in when in his in his walk in this world he never prays for them he tells the woman that was bent over for 18 years is woman i set you free i loose you he said and then he said this abraham's daughter was bound for 18 years does she not deserve to be loosed see because it was part and parcel of the covenant under which they were operating the old covenant you think no new covenant does not have healing in it the new covenant is a better covenant it has healing and a lot more in it so i don't know why we miss it i don't know why we neglect it i don't know why we apply it to only to salvation and not to anything else you know people try very hard to keep it within the limits of salvation and not take faith and apply it to other situations other problems in life but here we see jesus you know talking about faith and emphasizing faith he is not talking about the will of god he is talking about faith now he says to them do you believe that i am able to do this right and the people and the two men say yes lord and now look at the answer of jesus he touched their eyes saying according to your faith let it be let it be to you now if he asked them do you believe that i'm able to do this then when he laid hands on them to heal them he should have said because he asked them do you believe that i have the power to do this or i am able to do it and they said yes what should I, what should he have done he should have laid hands on them and said according to the ability that is in me be healed because that's what he asked do you believe that i have the ability to heal you do you believe that i have the power to heal you and they said yes so he should have said all right you believe that i am able to heal you so according to my ability be healed or according to the ability of god be healed hello that's what he should have said he didn't say that he asked them 
do you believe i am able to do this for you they said yes lord and he said he laid laid his hands on their eyes and he said according to your faith let it be to you not according to my ability not according to my power not according to even even according to god's will our god's power our god's ability he says according to your faith i say it like this because i want you to know that your faith is the most important thing in receiving the blessing of god in every area of your life he said your faith do you believe i'm able to do this they said yes and he says according to your faith let it be to you and they they went away healed the people that believe that we must pray let it be according to the will of god you know they they say salvation is the will of god but we don't know if healing is the will of god that's their thing you know that's the problem but the bible is very clear in salvation is included all of these things god sent jesus to die on the cross of calvary not only save us from our sin that's very important you see sin is the problem sin is the thing that caused all these things to come upon mankind but once sin is taken care of these things are also affected healing is part and parcel of this great atonement that has been done for us through jesus christ so Jesus is emphasizing the fact that whenever things happen in our life whenever we receive something like healing it happens not because it's just because it's God's will it happens because of our faith now if everything happens according to God's will and if it's God's will it will happen that's the way they, these people believe see if it's God's will whatever is God's will it will happen so when you go with so many needs and problems and so on we will say maybe if it's god's will it'll happen you know for example i've seen you know one fellow went and went to the pastor and said pastor pray for me i want to build a house you know i'm having a great desire to build a house for my family we are going from one place to another every year we are changing houses they don't let us live in one place for more than a year so i want to buy a house i want to i want to build a house for my family you know what the pastor said the pastor said well if it's the will of god it will happen if it's the will of god it will happen now with these things i am pretty sure and every christian ought to be pretty sure that is the will of god i don't know how it can't be the will of god it is the will of god i can i can even prove from the bible you know jesus god took the people of israel from egyptian slavery and brought them out brought them into the land of canaan the promised land the land flowing with milk and honey and gave these slaves every one of these slaves became landowners hello has any government done this everybody had land you believe that our god is different now <laughs> you know he wants some people to have land and some people to have house some people don't need house he thinks people have a problem you see they they are unable to think about god you see i i always say let your kingdom come lord then only our problem will be solved if his kingdom comes tomorrow we'll all have land i'm telling you everybody will have land everybody will have house <laughs> everybody will have everything that's the way i understand god when i read from the bible bible says in leviticus chapter 15 verse 4 god says to the people of israel let not there be even one poor among you that's god's will not one person must be poor among you he says that is the will of god and later on in verse he says that in verse 4 then verse 11 he says the poor will always be with you and jesus also quotes it in the new testament that doesn't mean that that's the will of god he said before he mentioned in verse 11 that poor will always be with you 
in verse 4 he said let no one be poor among you that is the will of god then why 11 says the poor will always be with you because there's plenty of crooks in this world that want to have it all and not let it not let it go out of their hands you know plenty of people grabbing and plenty of people being selfish and plenty of injustice plenty of wrong things happening in this fallen world therefore poor will always be with us not because it's the will of god it's because men are like this they govern like this they rule like this that's the way they do things in this world there is no justice how do you interpret it then god said let there be no poor among you then he says there will be poor among you always because he is prophesying he says i know where it's going cuz i see the way you guys are ruling and the way you guys are ruling people are going to have less and less own houses less and less of everything there's going to be plenty of poor and that's why we have plenty of poor in this world not because it's god's will don't you look at india or any other country in the world and look at the millions of poor and say this is the grand will of our wonderful god it is not the will of our god it is the making of men making of sinful men that have no vision for the well being of people that is what it is we blame it all on the will of god because it's very convenient so when you tell a man who wants to build a house if it's will of god it will happen then he's wondering 10 years later why it hasn't happened it's not the will of god if the same fellow came to me you know what i will do if he said i want to build a house i say why not god is able to do anything if you can believe all things are possible that's what i will say to him if you can believe all things are possible god will be your helper he will bless the work of your hand he will increase you day by day he will bless you and he will prosper you god's grace will be upon your life you will increase mightily don't worry you will be able to do it believe in it meditate upon it begin to speak every day by faith that you are going to build a house and live in your own house that your children will live in your own house you will sleep in your house that you will live a good life that's what i will teach him and i will show him from the word of god how it's the will of god for him to have this blessing from god i wouldn't say if it's the will of god it will happen so i give him some homework to do i if he comes to if the fellow comes to me i'll give him some work to do i say go to the bible and begin to understand what god's will is regarding these things regarding your life regarding your material side of your life determine what god's will is for you and believe in it stand on it proclaim it believe that the red days of renting will be over if you don't act militantly like this you're not going to ever get out of rent you know you're going to be always stuck believe that you can put an end to it very soon that it will be it will happen that god will open the door that god will bless you that's the way i teach that's the way a lot of people teach why because we believe that faith makes the difference will of god is not the problem i have no nothing in my mind that says maybe it's not the will of god maybe he's got to check uh, with god to see whether he's got to build it here or build it over there or whatever you know but i am sure that god wants him to have a house that i i am sure that god wants him to live with a great deal of dignity that portrays the blessing of god in his life i have no problem with that now what we do is we put everything on god so it becomes convenient it's a lazy man's philosophy you know if it's the will of god it will happen you know so you don't have to do any homework you don't have to go look into the bible you don't have to start believing you don't have to get your heart ready for such a blessing you don't have to proclaim it you don't have to believe it you don't have to speak it you don't have to expect it you don't have to anchor your soul with this hope that god can do this for you if god has given his own son the bible says and did not spare his own son and delivered him up for us all will he not also give us all things the bible says why not 
Is such a is, is a giving your house such a big deal to God? <laughs> I don't think it is. It's a very ordinary thing for God. God can do it. By faith you can move towards that direction and soon by faith you can receive it. Right? But the people that think everything happens by the will of God, they think the will of God, if, if it's the will of God, it will happen. I know that, you know, we have to respect the will of God. The, the, see, God has a big program. The big program, I know it, it's all happening by the will of God. For example, God planned our salvation and through Jesus 2000 years ago executed everything necessary for our salvation and for the last 2000 years he has been using the Holy Spirit to draw men to salvation. There is coming an end when Jesus is going to return and so on and we are going to be ushered into eternity. There is a big program that is God, that God is orchestrating and moving everything towards, everything is happening according to his will in that way for that big program. But whether you ate idli or puri this morning, what does it have to do with God? <laughs> it, doesn't have, it doesn't have to do with the will of God. Hello? Did you sit down before your table and they brought you puri and said, let me see if it's the will of God. <laughs> no. <laughs> you just assume that you are supposed to eat that you are supposed to have food. Are you going to say to a man in India, so many people can't eat three meals a day. Are you going to say to some of them, it's the will of God that you eat only one. That's good enough for you. When we go to heaven, you will have three or even four. But here, only one. But it may be the will of God. You know. No. <laughs> Hello, are you there? <laughs> Uh, what I'm saying is I'm a, we must apply faith to every situation. Every need, every problem that we face, we must apply faith. You know, the fact that we did not apply is crippling the church today. We are not effective today because people are going through problems and we're saying maybe if it's the will of God, God will, you know, we, we, we're just having this lazy man's theology, you know, that if, the, if it's the will of God, God will do it. If you teach faith, people will fight for it, will stand on it will begin to produce, will begin to be militant about it, will begin to say, I refuse to live like this because God wants me to live like that. The blessing of God is mine through Jesus Christ and I want to lay claim to it and possess it. That's what, that's what uh, Bible doctrine is all about. The people of Israel died in the wilderness. Why? Because they did not believe, they were in unbelief. Because they were unbelief, in unbelief, they refused to be ready to fight, ready to move forward, ready to take possession of everything that God has given to them. Those who believed were warriors. Look at Joshua and Caleb, they were ready, said, let's go. We can easily win, we can easily take the land. That was their attitude. But the lazy guys, the ones who entertained the lazy, if it's God's will, he'll give it to us. They stayed back and perished in the wilderness. All right, let's go to another passage. Go to Mark chapter 9. Here is another passage. I think this is also a very hand-picked passage by the apostles. They probably taught it again and again. <laughs> that is why it's recorded here. It had great value because of its teaching. So Mark chapter 9 the story starts actually in verse 17 um, where a man comes bringing his son and he says to Jesus that uh, his son has been demon possessed. He's got a mute spirit and whenever the spirit seizes him, it throws him down, he foams at his mouth, <laughs> gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. And he says, I took, them, took him to your disciples and they couldn't heal him. They couldn't do anything with him. And then in verse 19, Jesus now begins to speak. Because now he has brought the fellow to Jesus. And Jesus speaks. He says, he answered and said, 
Oh, faithless generation. See, he's condemning the situation where they are not exhibiting faith towards the situation. The fellow is demon possessed. And he's been teaching his disciples about faith and about healing and about all these things. He actually sent them out to heal people and so on. And it worked. Now he says, Oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me, he says. All right? Now those, that verse is very loaded. It seems to say that healing and all these things is not supposed to stop with him. It's supposed to continue and they better learn it, he says. How long shall I be with you? How long are you going to be without faith? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Verse 20, then they brought him to him. When he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? He said, from childhood. So from childhood days, this guy is suffering. This child is suffering like this. The spirit will come on him and throw him, foam at his mouth. He'll bite his teeth, gnash his teeth, and so on. And uh, verse 22, and often he has thrown him both into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. I said this is a hand-picked passage because it teaches us a lot. And the teaching mainly is this. Look at what the man says, the father says. But if you can do anything, have mercy on us or have compassion on us and help us. If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And look at the answer Jesus gave. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Now, most of the people that comment on this are pointing out that there is a play on words here. He comes, the father comes and says, if you can do anything, what does he say? He says, if you can do anything, please have compassion on us and help us. What is Jesus saying? If you can believe, the father is saying, if you can do anything. Jesus is saying, if you believe. Catch that. The father is saying, if you can do anything. Jesus is saying, basically, really I have nothing to do. If you believe, to him that believeth all things are possible. He turns it around. He turns around the father's statement which said, if you can do anything and says, if you believe. It's not whether I can do something, it's if you believe. See, that's very fundamental to faith. Faith is not based on what this man can do, that man can do, whether this man has power, that man has power. See, that's the condition Christians are in today. They're going to every place where they can go. Trying to see if that man has power. Now, I tell you, even if the man had power, if you didn't have any faith, it's not going to do anything to you. It's not that that man has power. We must have the faith. And that is why Jesus emphasizes more than his power that he has or his ability to do things. He emphasizes their faith. That is why in the first instance, when that man came and said, uh, when, the man, uh, when the two men came to him, the two blind men, he said, do you believe I am able to do this? They said yes. But then he said, according to your faith. It's not about my ability, but according to your faith. You believe it. That's the main thing. Because you have faith, according to your faith, let it be to you. And here the man says, if you can do anything, Jesus says, no, 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 if you can believe. It's not if I can do anything. It's if you can believe, if you can believe, all things are possible. This is how the Bible teaches. Everybody say, all things are possible. If we can believe. Now, some of the church doesn't like to hear that. That all things are possible if we can believe. See, God has created man with power and authority. The psalmist says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? You have put him over everything. 
He's the master over everything. He's astonished at the status God has given to man. But Christians are surprised and they, they don't want to accept these things. You know, they, they don't want to say all things are possible to him that believe. They, they think that is not Christianity. I say to you that is Christianity because Christianity and the salvation through Jesus Christ, the cross and all of this has to do with returning man to his original condition. Man is described as crowned with glory and honor. Placed above everything to be the Lord and master over everything. Except God over all the creation. That is why Jesus said, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but believes that whatever he says will come to pass. He shall have whatever he says. That is why the psalmist says, Oh, I'm amazed, he says, astonished because you made man like that. And that is why here it says to the poor man, that guy that's in a very hopeless condition, he thinks he's powerless, that someone has got to do something for him. He says, hey, you understand faith? If you believe all things are possible, all things are possible. If you can believe, all things are possible. I say to you, that is why when a person believes in Jesus Christ, his sin is not just forgiven. Sin forgiveness is only a small part of this salvation. Please understand. It is only a small part and we are, settled, we are very satisfied with that. We say a thousand thank you to God and we are satisfied that we finally go to heaven, you know. But salvation is not just about our sin, forgiveness of our sin. Salvation is about us returning to the position that God put man in in the beginning. Salvation is returning us to power and authority. Salvation is to return us, make us people of power and authority. That is what salvation is all about. So, Jesus says, if you can believe, man comes saying, if you can do anything, Jesus turns around and says, if you can believe. There are a couple of English translations, since this is an English audience, I can read the English translation. I even read it to the Tamil once and translated it for them. A couple of English translations says it very beautifully. American Standard Version gives this verse like that. After the fellow says, if you can do anything, please have compassion on us and help us. Look at Jesus' answer. It's translated like this in American Standard. It says, yes, said Jesus, if you can. Exclamation, if you can. If you can do, please have compassion. If, if you can do anything, please have compassion and help us. Is the plea of man. And Jesus says, yes, if you can. If you can. In other words, if you can believe. Yes, if you can, then he says, all things are possible to the one who believes. Good news translation is another wonderful translation says, Jesus says yes to that man when he said, if you can do anything, please have compassion and help us. Jesus says yes, if you yourself can, that's even better. If you yourself can, everything is possible to the person, for the person who has faith. Everything is possible per, for the person who has faith. But that you yourself, if you yourself can, is very powerful. They have understood the essence of what is happening there. If you yourself can, that person, the father comes to Jesus thinking that here is a gifted man, a man from God. He's got all the power. He's seen healing uh, here and there and heard about him much. He thinks he can do it. But the whole emphasis is placed upon this man's faith where Jesus says, if you yourself can, I don't think the person thought that his faith even mattered. But Jesus says, if you yourself can. If you yourself can. Amazing. See, salvation is a model for faith. See, how do you get saved? Romans chapter 10 verse 9 and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be 
saved. That's verse 9. That's a classic scripture on salvation. How do you get saved? If someone comes, says, I want to receive Christ as my Savior, we say, confess him with your mouth. Confess him as your Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You shall be saved, right? That man is coming because he is convicted and the Holy Spirit is dealing him and the, and the whole thing happens by faith. He must confess with his mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in his heart that God raised him from the dead. How do you exercise faith for other things? The same thing. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. How do you receive healing? Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart. How do you receive deliverance? Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. You did it at the starting point at salvation, but you do it now every time as you exercise your faith. This is the basic exercise of faith. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. This is how faith works. Salvation is a model for faith. But not only that, look at salvation. God wills that nobody should perish, but everybody should have the knowledge of God, come into the knowledge of God. But look at how many people perished. perished. Like I said, the people of Israel perished in the wilderness. One generation perished except Joshua and Caleb. They perished in the wilderness. Why? Because that proves that even though it is the complete, perfect will of God for them to go to the promised land and God told them, I'm going to take you to a vast and a good land, land flowing with milk and honey. But he didn't take them. They died in the wilderness. Why? Because even though it is the perfect will and plan and purpose of God, it didn't happen. Why? Because things don't happen in our lives. Please listen. Things don't happen in our lives because it is the perfect will of God or it is the plan of God, it is the purpose of God. It doesn't just automatically happen. Things don't happen or we don't receive from God just because we need certain things and God knows we need. Things don't happen because these things are good and right and just and therefore it must be done to me in that way. No. We don't receive anything just because it's the perfect, and perfect will of God and plan of God and purpose of God. Then how do we receive? We receive everything by faith. Everything by faith. That's the way we're supposed to live. It doesn't happen just because it's a will. Just imagine, if everything is happening according to the will of God, that's what some people think. It'll happen. If it's the will of God, it'll happen. Now, if the will of God is done in everybody's life and it happens, then at least all the Christians will be so wonderful. Their life will be so blessed. They'll be blessed in every way. But the fact is it's not. Why? Because just to say that the will of God is this, therefore it will happen to me automatically is wrong. Yes, the will of God is important, that is established. And when we read the Bible, we know the will of God. But unless you act by faith to possess what God has given to you, it will never happen to you. It will never happen to you. See, that's the Bible teaching. Now, when we teach on things like that, there's a big grievance or accusation about this. That is, they say, well, these teachings, they don't understand that there are certain aspects of God's blessing that are there for now and there are certain aspects of God's blessing that is there for eternity. In Christian teaching, there is something called now and not yet. That is, there are blessings you enjoy now. There are blessings that you don't enjoy now. You have to wait. It's not yet. You don't enjoy it yet. You enjoy it only in eternity. So these people, they don't la know where the line stops, you know. They don't know the line between the now and the not yet. So they think that the not yet things are to be applied now. No, we are not teaching like that. I understand now and not yet very clearly. Let me give you some examples about now and not yet. Now, for example, sin. If you take sin, we are living in a world of sin. Sin is always around us. We are living in the presence of sin, surrounded by sin, everywhere. And I hope you realize that. But, we as Christians expect to overcome sin, live above that sin, 
and live victoriously over that sin we need the word of god and the help of the holy spirit every day because it's a sinful world sin is all around us everywhere you turn it's there but we are god's holy people chosen people therefore we must live above sin is that now or not yet it is now what aspect of the sin is not yet uh, what aspect belongs to the not yet you know what belongs to the not yet in the in the not in in the eternity there will not be any sin at all to deal with the the presence of sin itself will be removed the now the penalty of sin is removed you know through jesus christ the power of sin is overcome through the word and the holy spirit we are delivered from the power of sin and the, from the penalty of sin through jesus christ but in future in eternity the presence of sin itself will be removed that is now and not yet i am not saying we are living in heaven now when we talk about these kinds of things people say well you are not in heaven please remember you are on earth well i know very well we are on earth i am on earth but still i believe that in this sinful earth i can live for god free from sin overcoming sin every day by the help of the holy spirit by the word of god right secondly another example satan satan is a factor now In Ephesians 6 I taught verse by verse Ephesians 6 about spiritual warfare why spiritual warfare is a subject matter now because we got to deal with this fellow called the devil he is the reason behind a lot of problems he is causing a lot of confusion he is working on people's minds and thoughts and hearts and and uh, emotions and he is working in societies and countries and so on so we got to know his ways we got to understand how he works so that we can be aware of this and overcome and be cautious and not be caught in his trap so we examine the ways in which the devil works and he is an old devil he doesn't have any new tricks and he is not that smart also he is doing the same old thing again and that's why we learn from the bible how he works right but in the future in the not yet in eternity there will not be a devil to deal with just imagine what kind of life it will be when there is no devil if there was no devil now it will be heaven here you remove that one fellow everything will be solved you know but the problem is we got him right <laughs> but in eternity he'll not be there will be free from all that he does take for example sickness hello sickness the world is full of sickness because it is a sin cursed world sickness has become a reality and a factor that's why so many hospitals are there they're not enough we need more we need more doctors we need more hospitals we need all the medicines and all that because otherwise people will die you know diseases are attacking from everywhere you know you don't have to go and get any this sickness it will come to you you know wherever you are if you just drink water it will come to you you just breathe the air it will come to you that's the way it is because it's a sin cursed world sickness is all around us but if you get sick when you get sick do you just pack your bags and say lord i think it's ready to go to heaven because now i'm sick now that i'm sick i think it's the will of god that i just go away to heaven no i don't i was at the point of death one time but 11 years ago in the hospital about to die and i insisted i want to live because i got a work to do here i can't go <laughs> i got to live here sometimes you got to fight for your life again sickness you got to stand up and fight you got to exercise your faith apply your faith faith is for that you got to say no in the name of jesus I will not die but I will live and show forth the glory of God. If you're ready and packed and say Lord please take me then I'm sure he'll be glad to take you. You know. <laughs> but everybody around here will miss you. <laughs> so don't go. <laughs> be here as long as you can as long as you can be effective and 
and powerfully represent Jesus Christ on this earth and do things for God and live for God in this world for the glory of God accomplish what God has called you to do and then you can just close your eyes and say Lord I'm ready and you'll go <laughs> hello <laughs> are you there <laughs> We believe in healing for sickness. When sickness comes, we don't just fold up and die and say the chapter is closed, you know. No. We open a new chapter, a new chapter of healing and a new future, a new tomorrow. Everything changes. We experience God in a new way. We experience the miracles of God, healing from God. All of these things happen to us because we stand by faith, right? Now you can accuse me of teaching wrong if I taught saying you'll never die. Which I don't. I know that some people do. But I don't. We don't teach saying that we'll never die. The Bible says that we will die. It is appointed for every man to die. In this world. So that is a not yet aspect. The never die comes later on in eternity where we live with God forevermore and never die. Death will be no more, the Bible says. No more death. What a wonderful world it will be. As a pastor, you know, one of the things I do is go to funerals and so on. And every time I go to a funeral, I wish for the day when there will be no more funerals. <laughs> that there will be no more fun funerals. And I tell you that day is coming. Not now, but it's coming. So we are not confused about what is available now and what is available for the future. We are very clear about what is available now. Suppose somebody put a hundred million dollars or a hundred crores to you in the bank. Now sit up straight, I know you'll listen now. <laughs> <laughs> somebody put a hundred crores in the bank for you. And uh, the deal is, you can't touch it, you can't have it now. But every month you can draw some interest from it so that all your needs will be supplied through it, through that interest. You know what 100 million, 100 crores will bring to you every month? They say, if you had one crore, they'll give you 55,000 rupees a month. Just multiply it by 100. That's what you'll get every month. 55,000 times 100 is what 55 lakhs you think that's too little <laughs> how many of you think that will supply all your needs for in, in, in this life now now you're not now going to sit down and and sit, act like you're stricken with poverty and you don't have anything because the man who's put the hundred crores has said you can't touch it no he said you can enjoy some parts of it now, the interest on it now. Don't touch the principle, but you, are, you can have the interest on it now. And since the interest itself is so much, I will be rejoicing now. <laughs> Hello? I'm just living on interest of the richness of God's grace that has been provided to me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I'm withdrawing from the interest. I'm drawing every month, every day, every moment, every second from the rich resources that God has put for me. There are some things that I can't touch now, that I can't have now. I understand, I'm not confused about that. I know very clearly that there are some things only can be enjoyed in the future. But I am sure that there are things that I can enjoy now. It belongs to me now. I don't need to sit down here and starve and die now because there is plenty of resources that God has made available for me through Jesus Christ. For my spirit, for my soul and for my body, for every aspect of my life, God has provided richly because I'm a child of God and you are a child of God and God's love and God's grace has provided everything. That's the message. How I can draw? How I can make the withdrawal? By faith. Have you been withdrawing? <laughs> Some people have never withdrawn because they don't know it's in the bank. <laughs> it's there. 
it's there health is there <laughs> every kind of blessing is there for your spirit soul and body for everything that you need you can withdraw every day in every within the midst of every challenge every difficulty every need you have there is more than enough to withdraw from the rich resources of jesus christ our lord amen shall we all stand together amen let's lift up our hands and give thanks to god so we're going to hear about faith every week every single week if our faith matters so much then you better spend the time hearing about faith and learning about faith because that's what matters if you don't know about faith then you miss out on a lot if you know about faith then you can really live for god because there is only one way to live and that is by faith and without faith you cannot please god amen father god in the name of jesus we come we thank you lord for your abundant grace abundance of your grace it has provided everything for us for this life for your word says that everything pertaining to life and godliness is given to us we thank you for our present life and for eternity everything has been provided we are well taken care of we are redeemed we belong to you and everything that is yours belongs to us we are your children and i pray that you will teach us faith every time that we come around here every sunday as we come in that we will learn faith to exercise faith to grow in faith to walk by faith to depend on god for every need every problem everything in our lives and by faith overcome all challenges in life and move forward to accomplish god's will for us we pray your blessing upon people may this truth continue to ring in their hearts and in their minds and may there be a great revelation concerning these things in jesus name we pray amen now may the grace of our lord jesus christ and the love of the father and the fellowship of the holy spirit abide with each and every one of us for now and forevermore amen